did. Well, we can ask ourselves what the purpose of an educational system is. And of course, there are uh, sharp differences on, on this matter. Uh, there's the uh, traditional in, an interpretation that comes from the Enlightenment, which uh, holds that uh, the highest goal in life is uh, to inquire and create, uh, to uh, uh, search the uh, riches of the past, uh, try to uh, uh, internalize the parts of them that are significant to you, uh, carry that uh, quest for understanding further in your own way. The uh, uh, purpose of education uh, from that point of view is just to help people uh, uh, d determine how to learn on their own. Uh, it's you, the learner, who is going to achieve uh, in the course of education and it's really up to you what you'll uh, uh, what you'll master where you'll go how you'll use it uh, uh, how you'll go on to uh, uh, produce something new and exciting for yourself maybe for others uh, in the colleges in the schools uh, in the schools do you uh, uh, do you uh, train for passing tests or do you train for a, a creative uh, inquiry, uh, pursuing uh, interests that are aroused by material that's presented and that you want to pursue either on your own or in cooperation with others? And this goes all the way through uh, uh, up to uh, you know, graduate school and research. Just two different ways of looking at the world. When you, when you get to, a, say, a research institution like the one we're now in, at the graduate level, it, uh, it essentially follows the uh, Enlightenment tradition. In fact, science and, uh, uh, couldn't progress unless it was uh, based on uh, inculcation of the uh, urge to challenge, uh, to uh, uh, question uh, doctrine, question authority, uh, uh, search for alternatives, uh, uh, use your imagination, uh, act freely under your own impulses, cooperative work with others is constant as you can see just by walking down the halls. Uh, that's in my view what uh, an educational system should be like down to kindergarten. Uh, but uh, there's uh, certainly are uh, powerful structures in the society which would prefer people to be indoctrinated, conform, not ask too many questions, be obedient. Uh, fulfill the uh, roles that are assigned to you and don't try to shake systems of power and authority. Uh, those are choices we have to make either as uh, people that wherever we stand in the educational system as students, as teachers, as people on the outside trying to help shape it in the directions in which we think it ought to go. Um, my name is Paul Howard-Jones. It's really nice to be here today to talk to you about two sides of the same coin, which is essentially the, the effects of technology on the brain. Um, but in particular, I would like to focus on games and the brain as being potentially a special influence. If you're writing notes, I would suggest that you just take down this web address. There's lots of nice free stuff on there. 
Um, this is our network, our research network. We do basic fundamental neuroscience using neuroimaging. We also do bridging studies between the brain scanner and the classroom. Um, and we're also interested in developing classroom practice, which is something else again. Uh, we do public communication such as this, and we, uh, we consult with teachers because the debate about neuroscience and education is gaining a lot of interest, and increasingly neuroscience is impacting on educational thinking. I sometimes worry that educators are actually being left out of that debate. So an important role for us is to make sure that we consult with teachers, and in that way we'll be able to uh, more effectively present their views to government. So let's go back to games and education. Michael Gove said recently, when children need to solve equations in order to get more ammo, to shoot the aliens, it's amazing how quickly they can learn. Immediately, somebody from uh, a more established uh, gaming uh, institute said, great, but what about exploration, experimentation, team building, problem solving, independent, personalized, differentiated experiences, all these other facets which we think might be very important for what makes a good educational game. But it's only recently, and I think it, some of this criticism is still ongoing, there's a sense in which much of this learning game activity has been something of a failure. So, into this context, let's see if neuroscience can actually shed any light on things. If you're interested in motivation and the thing that it makes us engaged when we come across something we find interesting, then there's one part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens which is particularly interesting. The amount of dopamine uptake in the nucleus accumbens um, is proportional, that's the uh, little bit there, number there, um, that is proportional to the amount that you desire something. Okay, And we're talking about a very visceral type of motivation here. Yes, I realize that education motivation, educational motivation is often more about deferred gratification. It's about longer term goals. It's the fact that you want to please your parents. It might be about the fact that you want to become a doctor. You're inspired by somebody. All of that is very important. I'm actually talking about a very visceral type of motivation, which I also think is important in the classroom, or could be. And it's the same type of motivation that that cat is experiencing there when it's looking at the goldfish. I don't think that's about exploration and experimentation. I don't think it's about feline identity, building a social, building a community of practice. I actually think it's about the activity in the motivation system of the brain. And it's to do with that cat's nucleus accumbens. What we find, I'm moving from cats to monkeys now, what we find in this particular experiment is we are measuring the monkey's dopamine response uh, when it looks at different visual patterns. And we find in this experiment here that the pattern is coming on here, and then sometime later, this monkey is going to get possibly a reward. Sometimes this pattern here is 100% associated historically with it getting that little drop of honey, which is a reward. And when it sees one of those patterns, as soon as it sees the pattern, it gets a spike of dopamine. And actually, when the pattern, when, sorry, when the reward actually arrives, when the little drop of honey arrives, it doesn't get any dopamine response at all because it's a wholly predictable event. Sometimes it sees patterns it's never seen before or that have never been associated with a reward. When it sees those patterns, then there's no spike of dopamine because it doesn't it's not expecting anything to happen. But when the reward arrives, yes, there is a spike of dopamine. That's very nice. Thank you. I want that. What's really interesting is when it sees a pattern which 50% of times in the past it's received a reward for, 50% of times it hasn't received a reward for. And then you get a spike of dopamine when you see the pattern, and the dopamine ramps up until the outcome is known. Now, if you integrate over time, that means there's more dopamine sloshing around the reward system for uncertain reward than either wholly predictable reward or wholly unexpected reward. And that may explain why a lot of situations in gaming, and I have to say gambling as well, generate a lot of motivation, a lot of this approach motivation. Now, this reward response is important because dopamine helps orientate our attention. When you see chocolate cake, that dopamine is going to be responding, and that helps orientate your attention towards the chocolate cake. But it also enhances synaptoplasticity. That's the making of connections between neurons. In other words, the basis for learning. And we can now move on from, I hope we can move on from, sorry, I'm confusing myself with too many. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. 
What I was going to say next, actually, this is a, a, an extra slide that I added, because I, a lot of people might say, well, why do we have this? You know, why do we have this attraction to uncertain reward? It doesn't really make sense. And actually, this is a bit of a mystery, because to often explain something in evolutionary terms, you have to go back to prehistoric practices of hunter-gathering. And actually, foraging behavior can be totally explained by the reward response and modeled by the reward response using neurocomputational modeling without any additional incentive provided by uncertain reward. On the other hand, hunting often means that you have to sustain motivation over a very long period of time, and the outcomes are very, very uncertain. We also find that this mechanism is more present in males than it is in females. So all of that may possibly suggest that um, our remaining hunters might be able to tell us something about why we are attracted to uncertain reward. And if anybody wants to fund a little expedition to uh, northeast Namibia, then please do see me after the show. And I'm, I'm serious about that. Um, but I was saying that uh, reward is, is very much about learning. Reward can actually promote learning. This is fantastic news, because in the past, we haven't had any relationship between reward and learning. The number of gold stars that you give a child in the classroom does not predict learning. But what we do find is that the brain's response to reward does predict learning. And what we're looking at here, if I dare go back to the laser without getting confused, we've got um, memory along the bottom, and we've got uh, response of the nucleus accumbens going up the vertical axis. And you can see there's a nice uh, linear relationship. The more the nucleus accumbens is activated, the more you are likely to remember um, what is going on around you. The actual mechanisms for this is still an aspect of research, but the fact that it exists um, is really uh, very clear. So this rapid scheduling of uncertain rewards that we find often in video games can it help explain two facts? Firstly, why we get such a high midbrain dopamine release in video games, and we do. It has been compared, uh, one scientific study compared it to the amount of release that you get for some psychostimulant drugs, such as methylphenidate, otherwise known as Ritalin, and some amphetamines. So it's a really very, very strong response. Um, and it might also explain why video games are powerful teachers. They don't always teach what we want them to teach, but there is no denying they are very powerful teachers. They can, for example, within a few hours, say about 10 hours, enhance transferable visual motor skills. That's something that scientists have been trying to do for decades and failing, whilst all the time, action video games in children's living rooms have been doing it, and we've only just started noticing. Little wonder, then, that video games have now become the subject of scientific interest. We want to know how they work, because they're working much better than we'd designed anything we'd designed before to enhance cognitive function. You can even see this enhancement of cognitive function in some types of professions. For example, practice on a Wii will improve your laparoscopic surgery skills. Um, the Israeli Defense Force insist on their pilots playing action video games because it improves their performance in the air. And my personal feeling, having looked at the evidence, is that there is an overwhelming case for assuming and for considering now that violent video games do promote aggressive responses. In the same way as there is an equally convincing argument that pro-social games can produce positive effective responses such as empathy. How on earth could these video games uh, be such effective teachers? Well, probably because of the way in which they affect the reward system in terms of this very rapid schedule. But then you might say, but in school, we also have uncertainty. We don't know if we're going to get the question correct or not. Well, the studies show that as humans, we love 50-50 chances in games. But actually, when it comes to school, we prefer risks of about 87%. It has been measured at around 90%. We like to be fairly certain we're going to get it correct. And that's probably because academic failure has all sorts of implications for um, social and self-esteem. That failure in a game involving chance does not. So this suggests a sort of learning game approach where essentially you're disrupting that sacred reward consistency relationship that we, that we try to promote in schools, you're actually disrupting it by using uncertainty. Because that can increase the uh, reward response whilst at the same time protecting self-esteem. First thing we did was a bridging study. We asked children to 
ask their maths question from Mr. Certain or Mr. Uncertain. Mr. W Certain would just give them a point if they got it correct. Mr. Uncertain would toss a coin if they got it correct, and they'd get no points or two points, depending on the fall of the coin. And what we found was that in time, um, over the session, people more and more were choosing Mr. Uncertain, and particularly boys. Yeah, again, it has to be said, although the effect is also there for girls. I'm going to describe to you what I view as uh, one of the most exciting frontiers of human cognition, which is the study of avatars. And this story begins about 31 years ago at this point, which is sort of a shocking number to me because I still feel like a foolish kid most of the time. Um, so about that time, I had a little laboratory in Palo Alto, California, and we had built the first virtual reality systems. And they consisted of classical goggles and gloves and sometimes whole body suits. And you would experience yourself inside a made up world. Uh, even though at that time, the technology was astonishingly crude by today's standard, uh, the images we saw didn't even have filled in colors. They were just l line segments. I mean, it was really, really crude. That sense of being immersed was actually more profound and more advanced than probably anyone in this room has experienced because it's very, very rare to have access to true immersive virtual reality these days. When you do have a chance to experience, I hope you enjoy it as much as we have because it's really quite a marvelous thing. And it's been the sort of driving vision behind a lot of other technologies. It's sort of a destination point for many of us in the, in the community who make these things. So, Anyway, you're in virtual reality, and we had made the social system where you could have multiple people. And so if there are multiple people in a simulated world and they're looking at each other, there has to be some way they can see something of each other so they're not just sort of invisible ghost creatures, right? So thus we needed the avatar, and that was the birth of the avatar. And of course, the first avatars were as realistic as possible. And given how crude the graphics were at that time, that was not very realistic, and yet, there was a kind of an amazing expressivity. It turned, what we uncovered uh, in creating avatars was that there's an interactive subconscious language and body motion between people where the very subtle ways in which you lock into each other, particularly the way people are sensitive to each other's head motion, is so profound and so vivid and intimate that even if you're just sort of a stick figure, you feel a sense of connection to this other person. Um, I have a collaborator at Stanford named Jeremy Balenson, uh, and with Jeremy, we're, we're very slowly trying to create an atlas of usable avatars. We're trying to understand what the homunculus, which is the, the sort of pet name for the part of the brain that maps the body, what, how flexible can it be? What can you turn into? What potential is there? Now you might ask, what does this all have to do with education? And I'll tell you, what you do is you turn kids into avatars that are the things that they're studying. Uh, now this is something so cool that it's almost like once you get it and once you try it, once you see it, it's the simplest thing in the world, but it can take a second to understand it. So let me try to convey it. Um, you let's say you want to teach chemistry. So what you do is you turn a kid into a molecule. All right, so now um, there, you can make them into little molecules or big molecules. So they could be a little alcohol molecule or something, or they could be a big protein. Um, in the old days, we could only do little molecules. Um, so now you're this molecule, you move around, and what you're doing is you're, or, you're, um, you're moving around within the degrees of freedom of that molecule, and hopefully you have a very good software model of, that's up to date as, as far as how molecules work. In the old days, we had pretty crude models. Um, but you know, every molecule is this thermal thing that's kind of wiggling around and at the deepest level is kind of not in any particular shape, but there's this sort of range of motion. So you can imagine it as a, as a body map. Now, when you turn yourself into the molecule, there are a couple of levels of very interesting things going on. I'll start with the sort of level of emotion. Um, children and adults generally, and people generally, <laughs> are narcissists. We tend to be rather vain. We tend to be interested in ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's say if you are the molecule, that molecule is interesting because it's you. Um, that's a hard thing to it's a hard thing to see unless you're really doing it. But even if you have a wonderful simulation of a molecule and it's over here, then that's this other thing that you're supposed to pay attention to or that might intrigue you. But if it's you, 
it gets very interesting very quickly, and unavoidably so. So um, it le there's an emotional transaction that happens that's just really profound. Secondly, there's this really interesting question about cognitive styles. What we know is that there's a fairly wide range of differing personal cognitive styles in adults and in children. Uh, people, uh, s people have different approaches to learning. Some people emphasize some sensory modality over another. There are people who are more visual and people who aren't. There are people who, are, um, who have to learn uh, in a rational stepwise fashion and there are people who have to wait for an intuitive grasp of something. Um, none of these are hard and fast, and everybody is a little bit of everything. And in fact, I don't even think we have quite the right language yet to even talk about these things. My own sense is that we're learning about this more all the time, and hopefully as this sort of research goes on, we'll evolve a better and better vocabulary. Um, so if you hear me being a little vague when I speak about this, it's because I'm skeptical of the vocabulary we use now. But at any rate, um, the... Uh, there's one modality that's of tremendous interest to me, which, which we could call the somatic modality, which is the, how the body and the motion of the body relates to cognitive tasks. Now, to give you a sense of why I'm interested in this, I want to describe one um, phenomenon that's always fascinated me because it's sort, of, it's sort of starkly different from other things that I've experienced anyway. So, and this has to do with um, problem solving with the body and, it, and specifically playing the piano. So, if you're an improvising pianist, which I am, and you start to learn to play, there's this moment when you realize that your fingers are solving problems and how to lead voices, how to get from one chord to another chord, um, these very complicated problems in counterpoint and your fingers seem to be solving them faster than you could any other way, faster than you could explain them. You can find yourself looking at, listening to a recording of what you yourself just played and having to figure out how you did it. And you can do that consistently. And it's very, very weird. <laughs> and so, um, now we're, we're all familiar with the fact that somatic cognition is very high performance in real time. So what I mean by that is if you need to catch a ball, you have to move your hand to where the ball's going to be. So you have your whole, your cognitive and muscular system are looking ahead and being faster than events and able to, in order to do it. We also know that this can get pretty complicated. For instance, in team sports where there's strategy involved. What's unique, well, it's not unique, I don't think, but what's remarkable about the piano example is that they're clearly expli explicable logical rules and there's this sort of semantic problem solving space that is algorithmic basically and in that case you're still doing this very rapid look ahead style of cognition which is an amazing thing so the fact that improvising piano is even possible indicates that there's this capacity to connect logical problem solving and semantic complexity with this kind of body knowledge. And the reason that's interested, interesting is that as you start to study um, cognition and how people learn, how people do things, it becomes a very, a very natural um, correlate to look at the brain and look at how the brain is organized and which parts of the brain seem to be good at doing what. And so we have specialized regions in the brain. I like to think of the brain as sort of this planet if you could uh, flatten it out, you'd have this big sort of uh, sphere that is of patches that are specialized in different sorts of ways. And in particular, some of the most interesting, interesting things that people do are in what we call the multimodal areas of the cortex, where you have two specialized areas, and in between, you have sort of the two patterns of cognition that kind of blend together and create entirely new capacities. The capacity to speak, to have language, is a great example of this where we didn't have it before and then we had it and, and all the, 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 proto, the, the, uh, the, uh, the preceding capacities which included controlling sounds in the throat and uh, semantic un understanding of the world, these things kind of merged together to turn into language. And so in, in the same way we see a lot of instances of these, these sort of spots. And now if you look at this map of the brain, there's this giant part of the brain that's attached to the body, to controlling the body. And so just as a it's not unreasonable to say, wow, you know, if the body was connected to intelligence in new ways using technology, there ought to be a lot of intelligence there to connect to. That's the basic idea. Now, it's, not, it's often the case that that sort of simplistic or linear uh, way of thinking doesn't pan out as you might like. But in this case, I think we have a shot at it. 
So in addition to molecules, we've experimented with turning people into systems of mathematical equations, into segments of code, into all sorts of things. Um, I, I'll make a prediction that 20 years, 30 years from now, it'll become routine, especially in, in, uh, in technical learning, for kids to turn into avatars of what they're studying. I think you'll see a lot of people dancing to program, dancing to learn math. I think you'll see people who didn't think they could learn math in other modalities discovering that they can in this modality. So there are two maths. In a sense, this talk is the story of the two maths. And just to be clear, the kind of maths we see in the real world is all about modeling, you know, lots of things that you're trying to answer problems for. You know, how do you solve this? How do you set this up? Uh, there's a lot of creativity. Math in education looks a little different. Lots of uh, writing stuff by hand. If you're lucky, add a calculator in. That's kind of the very different styles. Lots of calculating, not actually working, working end things out. So what's the difference between these two? Well, it's pretty simple. Computers. You see, math in the last decades in the outside world has fundamentally changed as a subject. And the reason it's changed is because it's based on computers these days. In education, we haven't done that. The computer is somehow, if at best, an add-on. The thing isn't based on that. And that is the fundamental chasm that's opened up between the outside world and education in math. So let me take that a bit further. Let's start by asking, you know, why do we learn maths? And in particular, why is everyone in the world in an education system pretty much forced to learn math? Why is it such a mainstream central subject? Well, I think there are about three reasons that, are, that one could argue for that, particularly the mainstream subject. You know, reason one is technical jobs. It drives our economy. It's crucial to our economic development. Number two, it's kind of, you know, the world has become a far more quantitative place in the last decades. It's kind of hard just to survive in a modern society if you're not pretty good at sort of being quantitative and mathematical. And kind of one of the amusing things is even stuff nowadays that, that sort of doesn't necessarily look like math um, uh, often is. Let me, uh, actually, let me open up here what I was meaning to do, which I forgot to do in my setup, was I will open up uh, Wolfram Alpha and we'll ask, a question, you know, am I fat? And uh, if we ask such a question, you know, in the modern world, these sorts of things are quantified, right? I mean, in this case, it's, it's assumed, unfortunately, a, a weight rather below my, my, its default weight is below mine. I think mine's more like that, but I'm a little taller. And, um, you know, we're going off and we're getting a quantitative result for that. You'd never have dreamt, really, of doing this kind of thing in a quantitative way as the general public a number of years ago, but now you do. And I'm actually just about in the normal range there, so I guess that's good news. Um, that was, of course, engineered. So those were two reasons uh, why you would learn math. And I think the third, which is critical, is what I might call logical thinking. Math has been a sort of critical way over hundreds of years in which people have structured thought in a logical way. And again, that's a critical reason why it's important for everyone. So when we say we're doing math or learning math, what are we actually doing? Well, I think there are about four steps to this. The first one, which is completely screwed up most of the time, is asking the right question. What is it? What is the problem we're actually trying to solve? Have we got, have we distilled down the question we really want to ask there? Secondly, let's take that real world or theoretical world picture and turn it into a mathematical form. You know, what's the, what's the equation, what's the expression that represents that in a way that we can use the power of mathematics to then transform to, to an answer? So step three is indeed that transformation, which we call computation. And step four is kind of going the other way. Take the com computed result and turn it back into the answer in the real world. And there's a crucial step, 4B, which is verifying it, checking, did we get the right answer? Does it make sense or not? So guess what we're doing today in school? We're spending about 80% of the time on step three, by hand. Yet that's the one step computers can do vastly better than any human, even after years of training. 
So instead of making our students into third-rate third computers, what we should be doing is using computers for doing step three almost exclusively. There are edge cases where I think hand calculating is still important, particularly mental arithmetic and estimating and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, we should assume computers as the default for calculating. And we should focus students on these other three steps that are almost entirely ignored in school education. The crucial point to understand, maths or math is not equal to calculating. It is a much bigger subject. Now, why has this all got confused? Well, actually, it's not that surprising, because for hundreds, thousands of years, the limiting step in doing mathematics, as I've described it, was calculating. You know, you had to do it by hand. There was no other way, and that was typically what limited what you could do. What's got muddled up, that fundamentally changed with computers. Computers, if you like, have made the biggest change to any ancient subject that I can think of in human history in the last decades with mathematics. Fundamental to the subject has been computers do the calculating. So I think of calculating as the machinery of maths. It's the thing you'd like to get around if you could. It's just that for thousands of years, we couldn't. Now we can. And one of the things to think carefully about is, you know, people say to me, but you know, isn't it great that people should all learn hand calculating? That's kind of a, uh, you know, a useful thing. And I say, well, yeah, it, it might be great. If somebody's interested in the history of hand calculating, as I call our current maths curriculum, go ahead. That's great. Just like if they're interested in ancient Greek, like I kind of liked ancient Greek. The key question is, would you force somebody who doesn't have some interest in that somehow to go learn it? Is there a good societal reason to force them to do that? Well, you might argue there's no good societal reason to force people to do any level of education. That's a sort of question of the curriculum versus not, which has been much discussed in this conference. But let's say there are mainstream subjects that we kind of think have some real benefit for society, and you do want people to do it. You know, I wouldn't put ancient Greek in that category. Um, and I wouldn't put traditional maths in that category, but I would put the kind of computer-based maths I'm talking about in that category for the reasons, the general purpose reasons I talked about. And just to understand the extent of the problem, my estimate is per year, 21,000 average student lifetimes are used up learning hand calculating. That's a hell of a lot of human resource. So we better be damn sure we know why we're doing it. And we better make sure that what we're doing is justifiable. This is another place that I went to. This is a, a favela on the edge of Bogota called La Capria. And this is where the biggest challenges of the next century will be met. They won't be in our societies and cities. They'll be in cities like this. Vast, exploding, expanding cities full of young people, hungry for education, relatively poor, and they want new and different ways to do it. This area of Bogota will have many schools. Uh, many children will go to them, many more than used to. But the kind of education that they get there will ill-prepare them for the kind of world that they will face, where they'll have to be entrepreneurial, they'll have to uh, find different ways to earn their livings over the course of their lives, and where uh, thinking on your feet is an absolutely critical skill. What works in places like this? Well, what works are innovations that generate more education in some ways, but do it better by doing it differently. And the trouble is, with much of education policy, both here and around the world, the Millennium Development Goals enshrine this, get more children into school. But if the schools that they go to confine and condemn them to years of boredom, where they're almost certain to fall behind, and when they fall behind, they're more likely to drop out, then making sure that more children go and spend more time in those places is not necessarily progress. Instead, what we need are more ways to learn that are better by being different, by creating new recipes. And those new recipes come from what in the book we describe as high-impact social innovators. They are innovators because they create ways to depart from the standard school model 
teacher lesson classroom exam curriculum. They depart from that in some important way, but they do it at scale. MIT's OpenCourseWare has created a new way to make available knowledge learning uh, across the internet, 100 million users um, at scale. So what is it that these people have been doing? Well, I think there's one sort of diagram, let me offer it to you, one way of thinking about what they have done and indeed much of what we have talked about in this conference which explains it. And it's this relationship between these two things, systems and empathy. So divide the world into experiences which are high system, regular, rep reliable, repeatable, quantifiable, measurable, uh, and low system, tacit, bespoke, uh, unrepeatable. And then think of experiences which are high on empathy, you really connect with someone, and low on empathy, there's absolutely no connection. And you get a grid like this. Now, if you want a prime example of a high system, low empathy experience, it is a journey on Ryanair that starts roughly at six o'clock in the morning, where Ryanair take, um, take your money and when you buy your ticket, they take that as a signal to then declare a kind of war on you, which you know, lasts between buying the ticket to getting on the plane. If you want an example of a high empathy, low system experience, equally modern, it is the Saturday morning cycle ride that my family make to our farmer's market where we buy extremely overpriced cauliflower because it's in a basket and scattered with dirt. This is a kind of high empathy, low system escape from our world of high system, low empathy experiences. And we spend most of our lives too much system, little bit of empathy, too much system, little bit of empathy. So, where you don't want to be is here. This is where I went to school, the Vine Comprehensive School, Basingstoke in Hampshire, 1973. 2,000 boys running riot around a completely demoralized teaching workforce, no system, no empathy. The one thing that I learned at the Vine Comprehensive School was how to run fast when I needed to. That was the only thing that I emerged from of any merit whatsoever. So if you're in a, an experience like that, Actually, going up here might be quite good. Going up to where you might get some system at least. This is what the founders of KIPP really set out to do. They said, too much school experience is too unreliable, it's too chaotic, so let's create a system. And so you do see things like this. This is a, the product of a fantastic project to save the children project called Rewrite the, Fil uh, Rewrite the Future. But the reality is that too many of the children have ended up in very rigid educational systems that process them, that do things to them as much as doing things for them. This is, if you like, the McKinseyite view of the future. And in reaction to that, you find people heading down here to high empathy but low system experiences, homeschooling or the maverick teacher, what have you. The projects that I looked at, I think, live up here. They live in the high system, high empathy space. They are both very systematic. They care about how they teach. They've got uh, ways of doing that. They think through it. They're very structured in some respects, but they generate very strong relationships, both between teachers and pupils, but as importantly, between pupils themselves and probably between pupils and their families. So they're both quite systematic, they care about how they do things, highly empathetic. Bringing entrepreneurship into the schools is a uh, theme that I believe strongly in. Uh, I started a university called Singularity University with Peter Diamandis of the XPRIZE Foundation. Uh, it's uh, backed by Google and NASA, the American Space Agency. NASA gave us a permanent campus in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have about 60 faculty. I'm the chancellor and, and co-founder. Uh, we, we just, uh, our last class was 80 students, which we picked from 2,000 applicants. And what we look for in the admissions process is the ability to actually change the world. We're looking for young people 
who have already changed the world in some way. So a young woman from Nigeria who organized a new way of distributing water in her country is someone we're interested in. Uh, a British student who wrote an app for the iPhone with a million users is also someone we're interested in, someone who's actually ha shown that it can have an impact on the world. And then this, we do have courses which cover the kinds of things I talk about, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, biotechnology, uh, as, as well as the social, educational, philosophical implications, legal implications of the exponential change and improvement of information technology. But the core of the curriculum are projects that the students self-organize, so teams ranging from five to 12 students get together and actually pick a major world problem and apply exponentially growing information technology to, to solve that problem. And then the, this project is supposed to continue on indefinitely after the students leave the school, uh, and that has been happening. Uh, many new companies have formed and, or NGOs uh, to carry on these projects. So for example, one project is to address uh, housing in the developing world by being able to print out uh, little modules, like about this size, that you can snap together Lego style to create a high quality house using the emerging field of three-dimensional printing. Uh, another project is applying some modern decentralized water purification technologies to create uh, small units that can be distributed widely that are not centralized uh, that can overcome uh, the water problem, turn swamp water into clean drinking water. Uh, with this technology, we estimated we could uh, solve the uh, water problem in Africa for only a few billion dollars, which is a fraction of the cost of a single dam that moves dirty water from one place to another. But the point is to bring entrepreneurship into the schools, and I think we should do that with high school students and junior high school students, and not as some sort of after hours uh, extracurricular program, but it's something that is the core of education. Because if I think about what I've learned in my life, it's from my own projects. I have a vision and I have a passion to actually accomplish something. Along the way, I actually have to learn a few things, and those lessons have stuck. And we should give then students the tools to actually learn material, find the knowledge they need, mentorship or people who have done of these kinds of things before. That's what we do at Singularity University. Look at what young people have already done in the world. Uh, once you get to college, you have a little bit more freedom. So one college kid up near where I live uh, was looking around and wanted a better way of dating girls. And at that time, they had these books uh, that you got every year. And it had little thumbnail pictures printed of all the freshmen. So if you had a blind date with a freshman, you could see what he or she looked like. And it gave you a few clues about them. The Glee Club, likes tennis, and so on. Uh, they were called Facebooks. And he said, huh, you know, I could put these online. And then uh, the, the kids can add their own pictures, and they can say who their friends are. Uh, that was uh, 2004. And uh, today they have almost a billion users. The company is going public with a expected $100 billion market value. It was started by a kid in college. A few years earlier, a couple of students at Stanford in a late night dorm room challenge used their $1,000 laptops to show that they could actually reverse the links on the internet. You know, all the links go forward. They could actually figure out, they were able to figure out a way to reverse them. And they said, hey, you know, that would create a really good search engine. Uh, and so that's how Google was born. Uh, these are young people that had an idea and a passion, weren't even thinking about changing the world. They followed their own uh, instincts and changed the world. 